Good afternoon. Bienvenidos. Buenas tardes. And welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We are honored this afternoon to welcome back to the America Society Council of the Americas a dear friend of many of us here in the room today, His Excellency Juan Manuel Santos, President of Colombia. Welcome. Mr. President, we are so happy to have you here at the beginning of your term, second term. And this is an exciting moment of opportunity for Colombia, as we will hear from the President during his interview with Carla Hills today. I am certain that he will address the three legs of his agenda that he passionately spoke about in his inaugural address, La Paz, La Igualidad y la Educación, Peace, Equality, and Education. We are also very pleased to be formally partnering for the first time with our neighbor, the Council on Foreign Relations. We hope that this will be the first program in a long and strong partnership. Thank you, Maria Emma. And, and I, I want to welcome the CFR's co-chairwoman, Ambassador Carla Hills, a former board member of the Council of the Americas, who will interview the President this afternoon. And I want to give a very special welcome to some other people in the audience, Maria Angeles Hogin Cuellar, the Minister of Foreign Relations, Maria Angela, Cecilia Alvarez um, Correa, Minister of Trade, Industry, and Tourism, Luis Viegas, uh, the Ambassador of the United States um, to, uh, the Ambassador of Colombia to the United States, Gabriel Vallejo, the Minister of the Environment. Of course, our dear Maria Emma Mejia, the permanent representative of Colombia in the United Nations. Um, and Roberta Jacobson, the Assistant Secretary of State for, the West, for Western Hemisphere Affairs. And all the other representatives of the Colombian government, who I probably should have mentioned, but then we'd have no time for the President um, and Carla. And I want to thank, this is for the Council of the Americas, our 2014 Presidential Series sponsors, the AES Corporation, City, Corporación America, J.P. Morgan, Microsoft, and NEC, and of course Chevron, who is a sponsor um, as well. And I want to welcome everyone who's joining us from around the world. This is webcast, um, and thank our webcast sponsor, Telefonica. I would now like to introduce Carla Hills, who is Chairman and CEO of Hills & Company International Consultants. Ambassador Hills served as U.S. Trade Representative in the first Bush administration and as the first female secretary of U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is so cool, in the Ford administration. Prior, she was the Assistant Attorney General heading the Civil Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, and with that, Carla, I would like to turn it over to you. Again, it is a great honor to welcome everyone here today. Thank you. Sorry if those in the back did not hear the beginning, and I won't be redundant. I, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, you have the resume of uh, President Santos, so I will be undiplomatically brief so that we have maximum time with this extraordinary leader who has been so gracious as to share his time with us. 
Uh, last month, President Santos began his second term as president, and it would be hard to find an individual who was better trained to pick up the reins of running, I would say, any country. He uh, obtained his uh, Bachelor in uh, Economics and Business from the University of Kansas, a Master's in Economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science, a Master's in Public Administration at the John F. Kennedy School up at Harvard University. He served as a Fulbright Visiting Fellow at the Fletcher School, and he was a Neiman Visiting Scholar at the Harvard Business School. He served as an executive in the news media, and uh, he is no stranger to government. I met him uh, when he served as Colombia's first Minister of Trade in President Gaviria's administration, and at that time he was also appointed to be president of the 7th UN Conference on Trade and Development. Subsequently, he served as P President Pastrana's Minister of Finance and Public Credit, and then he served as President Uribe's Minister of National Defense before winning his first term as president in 2010. Mr. President, your campaign for this second term focused on peace. And when your victory was announced, you said very emotionally, this is the end of 50 years of conflict in this country. Now with FARC insisting on immunity and the victims of the conflict numbering some seven million are insisting on justice. Talk a little bit about assuming you get an agreement and you've been trying for two years, but assuming you get an agreement politically how will you be able to sell it politically if the members of the FARC do not serve some jail time? And how do you see incorporating the ELN into this process? First of all, thank you very much, the Council of, uh, of the Americas and Council of Foreign Relations for this opportunity. And I thank you all for attending and given me this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Carla. And uh, do you have an easier question? <laughs> um, no, the, I was, I was um, having a very interesting conversation with uh, Shimon Perez just before coming here. And, and uh, we were saying how it is much more difficult to make peace than to make war. Uh, making war is quite popular. And I tell it because I was Minister of Defense. And uh, when you make war and you show your trophies, uh, people will clap, will applaud you. Uh, and making peace is uh, much more difficult. Uh, when I decided to take this path, I had some red lines. Uh, I said, These are the red lines that uh, we will follow. And I told the FARC, uh, since the very beginning, you know, there is some rules of the game in this negotiation. Uh, we will, we will uh, follow these rules of the game and we will see if we can finish or not. Uh, and there were two conditions that I put since the very beginning. Uh, first, no ceasefire. No ceasefire until we reach the end. Uh, I did that because uh, we now have the military advantage, advantage in, in our side, and a ceasefire will be a perverse incentive for the FARC to prolong negotiations eternally, because they will be the best of all worlds, armed uh, with a dialogue and no military pressure. The other a condition which goes to the point that you were asking is nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And uh, this condition, I put it because uh, studying the peace processes other in 
other parts of the world and throughout history, um, a peace process in a way is the, uh, and I use uh, the analogy, or two analogies. Bismarck used to say making laws, making the laws is very bad, but when you see the law already in writing, it's a good law, uh, most of the time. Uh, I use another analogy is um, when a painter wants to sell a painting, he will not allow the, the buyer to see the painting when it's half done, only when it is finished. And that's what I think uh, should, we should do with the peace process. That's why nothing is agreed until everything's agreed. And why is that? Because each element of a peace process, in the case, in this case, the FARC, uh, put to the Colombian people by itself, individually, the, the elements, people will naturally reject it. They will say, do you want the FARC to, to uh, participate in politics? They will immediately say no, and the polls show that. No, no, how, how do you dare uh, tell me that these people are going to participate in politics with what right? They have only kidnapped, murdered, and, uh, and done all kinds of terrorism. Do you want the FARC to have any kind of uh, leniency? Or do, uh, will the justice system be lenient with the FARC? They say, by all means, no. But when you put to the people the whole package and tell them, this is peace, and this is the cost of peace, and these are the benefits of peace, people will say yes. So during the negotiation, this is an, another difficult, uh, uh, that's why I say it's very difficult to, to the process is difficult, because uh, the, no ceasefire, people say, well, why are you talking about peace? Uh, if you're killing, if you're killing each, uh, each other here in, in Colombia, we're talking La Habana and, and, and talking and, and, and in war in Colombia. It's difficult for people to understand. And again, the other part which is difficult is each element by itself is unpopular. Uh, so we have to finish the process and then take it to the people. Uh, I am uh, convinced because when you have when you explain, and we've been doing this uh, thoroughly in, in, in the recent past, to people who are very reluctant or very negative to the peace process, and explain to them the dividends of peace, and they understand that, they will say, no, if that's the case, yes. So, and I am sure that if we reach an agreement, we will be able, and that's part of my responsibility, to sell the agreement to the Colombian people, because one of the also conditions that I put to the FARC and, uh, and to myself is I will negotiate a process that will be put to the people for the people to decide. So they will decide if what I negotiate is acceptable or not, which is a, in a way a safeguard uh, for the whole people. And, and when you explain that also, then um, people will say yes. What has happened? Well, there's a lot of enemies of peace. Always uh, enemies of peace appear uh, because they have a, an economic interest. I am sure that the drug traffickers in Mexico don't want peace in Colombia because they will run out of their supplies, the, the raw material which we send to them. Or people who have been living out of fear uh, in politics. They, they don't want peace because they know how to man manipulate pe uh, uh, fear. So there are different pockets of resistance, uh, uh, if, I may, if I might call them, uh, uh, that you have to confront. Uh, and uh, uh, they have been trying to um, feed uh, bad information about the process, which uh, I am glad that I take the opportunity to to tell all foreign investors in Colombia, there's nothing to worry about. There's, I'm not giving this the country to the FARC or to the, they call it Castro Chavismo. Uh, that's, that's not gonna happen. Uh, uh, there's nothing that I'm negotiating 
that should worry a foreign investor or a Colombian investor. We're not negotiating uh, our political institutions. We're not even negotiating our economic model. We're not negotiating private property. Nobody's going to be expropriated. Uh, nobody's going to suffer. On the contrary, the dividend for Colombia, uh, just last week, the University of Los Andes made a, a thorough study of what would what would be the positive implications of peace? And uh, they're, they're very, very attractive. Uh, the growth rate of the country will, will go up at least 2% per year forever. And if we are growing now at uh, 6%, we will be growing at 8%. And uh, this is uh, uh, one of the very, very uh, uh, of, of the many uh, positive implications for peace. So I am quite confident, to answer your question, is that the Colombian people, when they have the package, because I know where I want to take the peace process, when they have, we have finished the process, they will accept it. And how will you work in the other, the uh, ELN group? The ELN uh, has, has this, uh, uh, demonstrated or has said they want uh, to be in, to, to go into the process. Uh, we had a secret uh, period of negotiations with the FARC that they respected uh, the secrecy and the confidentiality. And um, we might do something with ELN, and please don't ask me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me go to another topic <laughs> that you had in your uh, inaugural address, which was very eloquent, and that was greater equality in Colombia. And some commentators have mentioned that equality is, uh, is ext inequality is extreme in your country. So talk a little bit about what your administration can do and in particular how you will address the really difficult problems facing the Afro-Colombian population. Well, uh, part of the, of the big challenges that we have is uh, to make our, our country a more equal country. Uh, you're quite right. When I arrived uh, four years ago to the presidency, Colombia had the second highest inequality uh, index in the whole of Latin America after Haiti, which is very, uh, very worrisome for us and shameful for us. Uh, so this part of my economic policy and social policy has been a priority since the very mm, first day of my government. And uh, thank God we've been able to to be successful in starting to reduce this inequality and especially starting to reduce poverty. Uh, we reduced in the first four years of my government almost 10 percentage points of the poverty from 39 to 29.5%. Uh, I don't see, I don't know of any other country who has reduced poverty as much in four years. And <coughs> extreme poverty. Two million Colombians went out of extreme poverty. 3.6 million Colombians went out of poverty itself. But the good, the good uh, uh, news is that our, what they call, the economists call the Gini uh, yes. uh, index has started to come down for the first time. And we are now not the second. We are more or less on average for Latin America. Still, we have a long way to go. We still have 30%, almost 29.5% of the population in poverty, and uh, roughly a bit over 9% in extreme poverty. One of my goals is to eradicate extreme poverty in Colombia in the next 10 years. If we were able to bring down extreme poverty by six percentage points, almost six percentage points, then we can bring it down to zero if we, if we are, ab are able to sustain our economic uh, growth. And this is the two go together. Uh, you have to have a strong economy and the resources to, to focalize your investment in 
social investment that will take people out of poverty. And that's what we've been doing with a high degree of success so far. Uh, we need to maintain a high, high rates of growth in order to have the resources to, it's like a virtuous uh, circle. And uh, we are now in the virtuous circle. The big challenge is to maintain it there. And of course, uh, to, ma to maintain the, the economy where it is, you have to have a fiscal uh, responsibility policy uh, that will allow you to have credibility in the international markets. We introduced in our constitution the concept of fiscal responsibility. We now have a fiscal rule. Uh, people uh, said two years ago when we approved it in Congress that I would, I would be sorry about that. Uh, in a way, uh, I'm, I'm being sorry because it, I can't spend any more, but I know that's a good investment for the future. And uh, we now have the first rate of growth of the whole of Latin America. Uh, we have the highest investment of the whole of Latin America. We have the lowest inflation. Uh, so we're doing quite well in the economic indicators. The big challenge is to maintain the economy growing at that rate and to maintain the social uh, policies because they go together. I'm, I am what uh, Mac McClarty would call the, a third way man. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, I think the third way for, for Colombia is, is the correct way. Grow, but re redistribute also. I know that uh, in some areas, redistribution is not a popular word. In Colombia, it's a must. It's a must be if we want to maintain our economy healthy. Well, you mentioned social programs, and you talked about education in your inaugural address. Uh, I just see uh, Angel Garia here. Well, the OECD has a program called the Program for International Student Assessment. And students in Colombia fall at the bottom of that assessment. So why do you think that is a fact? And what can you do about it? Um, first of all, uh, I say hello to Angel Gurria. Uh, we've been friends for many years, uh, and we've decided to become members of the, or tried to become members of the OECD because we wanted to compare ourselves with the best. I say this is a, not a club of rich countries, but a club of countries with best practices, and that's why we want to be members of the OECD. And uh, why did uh, we were at the very bottom of the uh, exam that the OECD made on, on their members because exactly that's what I wanted to, to, to compare with. I don't want to compare Colombia with, I don't want to mention countries but in, in the region, but I want to co compare <laughs> Colombia with uh, Finland, with Korea, with uh, uh, Japan because it's a, it's a global world. So we want to compare ourselves with the best. And the uh, index that, or the exam that the OECD made was was made in the year 2011, 2012, for the last 10 years. Also, they were measuring, I don't want to look backwards, but they were measuring the past governments. And uh, <laughs> uh, what the OECD said uh, between 2012 and 2014 is that we have been putting in place the correct uh, changes in order to start improving the quality of our education. Because uh, education, uh, and you're quite correct, I said, peace, equality, and education. And there, those are three uh, concepts that, are, that uh, have a lot to do with each other. You cannot have peace with a, a country so unequal as the one we had. So we need to achieve more and more equality if we want to have a sustainable peace. And the best way to reach a more equal country, the most effective way, is through education, because that's probably the most effective way of social mobility, to, uh, to achieve social mobility. So they are dependent one with the other. We have, we were able to, um, to make uh, public education completely free for every single 
a boy and girl in Colombia from kindergarten to 11th grade. Now they're completely free for public education. Uh, we now have to improve the quality. We're doing a tremendous effort in early childhood where we were way behind and th that's the most profitable social investment that you can make in any country, early childhood. And we're making a tremendous effort to give more access to the people, the kids that go out of school, of high school, in order to go to university. We are improving the budget on access to uh, what we call high education, uh, universities and technolo technological schools. And we are w our dream, that's the dream I put to the Colombian people, is to be, uh, and it's a bit presum presumptuous, but I think we have to have high goals <coughs> to be the best educated country in the whole of Latin America by the year 2025. Very impressive. This Friday, the uh, foreign ministers of uh, Mercosur and uh, the Pacific Alliance will meet in Chile, and they'll discuss ways that the two economic groups could work more closely together. Well, Mercosur uh, represents some of the most restricted uh, trade nations, and uh, the Pacific Alliance, some of the most liberal. How do you see them coming to an agreement? What do you see them doing together, and how will it affect this uh, hemisphere? When, when you were a uh, special trade representative and I was Minister of Trade, and uh, we started uh, to to think uh, about a free trade agreement between the U.S. and Colombia, and we were also promoting integration in Latin America, there was a concept called open integration. Uh, what did this concept mean? That you could go at different speeds. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, the alliance, in a way, has this concept in mind. We decided to, to, to get together, Mexico, Chile, Peru, and Colombia, because we said we have a lot in common. We have similar visions, similar values and principles, and our economies are all, the four economies are doing, are, are performing better than the average of Latin America. Let's get together, but not as a competition, as some people have said, uh, with the other areas, with Mercosur or with Brazil, or but as an effort to, let's unite, let's start accelerating our integration, and if s anybody wants to join in, they're welcome. And we don't want to compete, we want to expand if people want to join in. And that's exactly what, is, what has been happening. In, in the last three years, we have been able to speed up our integration, which is m much more than a free trade agreement. Uh, we now have, uh, free uh, movement of, of people, no visas for tourism, no visas for businessmen, uh, uh, the financial markets are integrated, uh, we are, uh, are now having uh, exchanges in the education area, uh, people from <coughs> Colombia are going to study in Mexico or Chile or Peru and vice versa, and we want to continue uh, as fast as we can. And Mercosur, if they want to join, they would more, more than welcome. Uh, but if they want to maintain their policies, that's up to them. Well, I think this is time to go to the audience. Is there a question that... Do I see a hand? Oh. Would you stand and uh, say your name? Uh, I cannot see around the corner to Ah, uh, you have a microphone. Wonderful. Hello, Mr. Mr. President, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Devery Bufner Vorwerk, and I'm with Cargill. And first of all, I want to congratulate you on your re-election and all that you're trying to achieve. Um, you're undertaking some, some great issues. And one that was not mentioned, but I know that you've shown leadership on, is land reform. And I was wondering if you could provide some insight into the progress on land reform and um, a pathway forward for that. Um. The, the land reform uh, is, is not the traditional land reform 
of the 60s and 70s. So we're not expropriating anybody. Uh, fortunately, we have land for everybody. There's plenty of room. What we have agreed with the FARC, and uh, this is something that I, I tell everybody, what we agree with the FARC is something that we, sh we should do with or without the FARC, which is bring more investment to the rural areas where w poverty and inequality is concentrated. Uh, there's, we are like in the U.S. in the, uh, the 19th century. You know, the, the West was yet to be conquered. Where we have half of the country to be conquered. Most of that areas are without owners. They're owned by the state. And what we have to do is try to uh, put in place um, uh, ventures that will allow us to give land to the peasants and at the same time bring investment that will make the, the, the that terrain uh, uh, productive because most of it is without any production we have we have 4.5 million hectares in production at very low with a le very low productivity we can increase that tremendously but we have more than 11 million hectares that are completely unproductive that's we where we can have a, a, a tremendous potential. Con uh, Colombia, according to the world, uh, to the food, uh, to the FAO, how do you call that in, 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 in uh, English? Food, uh, food, la FAO, como se llama? Food and agriculture. Food and agriculture, they say that there are only seven or eight countries with a very high potential to increase the production of food. One of them is Colombia, and we want to do that. And we are putting in place uh, legislation uh, at this uh, next few weeks that will uh, allow uh, the big businessmen and small persons to uh, have the joint have joint uh, 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 ventures that will give everybody a chance. And I think this is the best way to go. And many of the of of the land that is now in the property of the state we will lease that land we will use the english system uh, 60 year or 50 years or 40 years lease you produce the land the land is government owned but we, you will rent it for a long time uh, exploit it and then give it back uh, in whatever years are necessary and so this is a type of, of reform that we are making. It's, a, it's creative, it's uh, ambitious, and I think will allow us to, to make a major development in that half of Colombia, which is still uh, completely uh, unconquered or unexploited. And you might state your name. Carlos Gutierrez. Gracias. Uh, you've done a great job in, in increasing oil and gas production. Can you talk about the role of shale, if, if there are uh, significant deposits, and the role of shale in the growth of, of Colombia? Well, according <laughs> to the chairman uh, of the commission that President Obama uh, created. He's now professor of MIT, former CIA. What's his name? Deutsch? Pro <coughs> professor Deutsch. Uh, he was in Colombia and he, and, uh, he went to say hi for uh, five minutes and we stayed three and a half hours. <laughs> uh, marvelous man. Very well uh, informed of, of shale gas. And I, I asked him a lot uh, about <coughs> potential of Colombia. Well, apparently, Argentina and Colombia are the two countries that have the highest potential there. What are we doing at this very moment? We, since then, that was more than a year and a half ago, I told my people, uh, go to all the countries that are thinking about this issue. Come to the US, go to France where it's prohibited, uh, go to everywhere, and try to use the best practices and to learn about the best regulation possible. We 
have this regulation in place uh, in the uh, how 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 many weeks ago w when 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 will this be a, a week ago so and we have already given uh, some areas to start uh, making a, an experiment on this uh, uh, to start seeing how we can uh, with a very strict regulations to start exploiting uh, this <coughs> this type of, of of shell gas and shell oil uh, so we are going <coughs> carefully, but we want, of course, to be able to exploit uh, these uh, resources that apparently we have a lot of them. We have a question here. Angel? Well, <coughs> r rather than, than a question, uh, it's simply a, a commentary. Uh, Colombia is now um, in... Uh, kind of in a role in terms of its process to join the OECD. And I simply would like to say that if we had every single member of the OECD um, with the same degree of commitment, with the same degree of enthusiasm, and with the same degree of uh, professionalism in terms of the teams with which we're interacting, and then with the uh, conviction and the decision that, you know, when, when things like the PISA study that you refer to, which show that Colombia is lagging, uh, and instead of feeling that it's a criticism or feeling you know, aggravated by, by these are facts, then this is taken by the government, by the president himself and uh, his ministers and his teams uh, as leverage in order to promote the reforms, to change the laws, to change the regulations, to change the, curricu uh, the curriculum, to change. And, uh, you know, on, on productivity, the question of uh, uh, education, yes, but also innovation, also competition laws, also the flexibility in the labor market, the flexibility in the product markets, the, the R&D, um, the, the public administration. You know, we, we've, we've been asked, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the health systems, we've been asked by the government to make in-depth analysis about every single one and it's not that this is part and parcel of the process, but it's a, it was an opportunity to use the process in order to go in depth and then do whatever I it was that needed to, to, to be done. So I'd just like to register uh, from the point of view of the OECD uh, as, a, as an unbiased, uh, you know, totally evidence-based observer that, uh, that we think they're doing a great job. Uh, and, and it's not just because they want to join the OECD, but every one of these reforms is because they think it's a good idea and uh, we certainly believe that uh, that Colombia is going to be uh, better off uh, with them. Thank you, Angela. I, I, I am sorry I didn't hear that uh, before the campaign. I would, I would have used that in my campaign. <laughs> yes, way in the back, I see a hand. And others, as you're thinking about it, raise your hand because the lights are very strong here. It's difficult to see you. Do you have a microphone? It's coming. Uh, thank you, Jonathan Chanis, New Tide Asset Management. Could you share with, uh, with us your assessment of what's going on in Venezuela? And how do you see the state of Colombia and Venezuelan relations and its future? Uh, Venezuela. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Venezuela is a country that is near Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, no, I have to be very, very prudent on what I say about Venezuela. Whatever happens in Venezuela has a tremendous impact in Colombia. We are been, we've been trying to help in Venezuela to see if dialogue between government and opposition can, can take place and can have concrete results. Um, we are interested in the stability of Venezuela. Anything that happens there will affect us dramatically. And so anything we can do to help the Venezuelans, the Venezuelans, and by Venezuelans, I, I tell all Venezuelans, we will be there. Uh, we, um, in my case, as maybe many of you know, I was very, um, very critic of former President Chavez, uh, but I decided when I was elected president, I decided to uh, 
convert that criticism in, in uh, a good relation with Venezuela, respecting our differences. There's a, and uh, this we have been able to, to um, work with since uh, the 10th of August of, 19, of, of 2010 until today. Uh, President Chavez uh, died, Maduro replaced him, and we have been following the same, uh, the same uh, uh, approach. Uh, there's tremendous differences between their way of thinking and my way of thinking. But we respect those differences. We respect, we respect each other. They respect our way of thinking. We respect their way of thinking. And if we have any problem, we will solve them not through the media, but through diplomatic channels. And that has so far worked very well. And I w would like to continue uh, to work in that way because I think it's better for the Venezuelan people, better for the Colombian people, better for the region. and. Uh, but uh, but uh, feel sure that uh, our interest is uh, very much the well-being of Venezuela and stability in Venezuela because for us it's a priority. We have a question up here. Uh, first over here and then there. Uh, let me hand you my microphone. Thank you, Carlo. Mr. President, thank you for coming. I'm Eric Farnsworth with the Council of the Americas. The OAS has announced the next Summit of the Americas for April in Panama. You were the host of the past Summit of the Americas. Could you give a sense of what you think the agenda for the summit should be in April, having gone through it most recently yourself as host? Uh, they have already an agenda. Uh, Minister, help, help me with this one. Um, one of the issues here is Cuba and the US. And uh, I will tell you quite frankly, uh, if Cuba doesn't go, there'll probably, there'll probably no summit. And so we have to work and uh, we're more than willing and I think every country is willing to try to help things in order to have a summit uh, with the US. And uh, so we're working on that. Mr. President, uh, Alan Fleischman from Laurel Strategies. Uh, Medellin has become known now as the innovation, or one of the innovation entrepreneurial capitals in the world, and I'm just curious, why is that happening, what's happening, and for those who are interested in bringing investors and entrepreneurs to Colombia, what do we need to know? Well, uh, Medellin, uh, you're talking about Medellin, the, the you all, read about Medellin for many years, decades, about being hell. You know, the, 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 the Medellin cartel and the, the, the capital of, of drugs, of, uh, of kidnappings, of violence, and, and uh, they, there's a saying that adversity helps the character. Well, I think adversity has helped Medellin to, to have the character to change. And uh, the people from Medellin, Antioquia are n natural entrepreneurs. They're, they are uh, historically the, the most uh, entrepreneurial uh, of all Colombians are the people of Medellin. Uh, our ambassador from, for is from Medellin. She's very entrepreneurial. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, they, I think they, they, they have been able to use that adversity to their advantage and now they're flourishing. And, and still, we still have problems, of course, but Medellin is an example of how you can change. Medellin is an example of what has happened in Colombia, of a country that was, uh, when uh, Mac McClarty uh, and uh, President Clinton went to, to Cartagena to, to sign uh, Plan Colombia. We were on the verge of being declared a failed state. Colombia, all of it, by all the academics in the world. Failed state was a state where the state cannot control, there was no justice, and we were on the verge of that. That was 1991, 92? 93 or? No, 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 no. Plan, Plan Colombia, when, when President Clinton went to, to Cartagena, was, uh, he went with, Joe Biden was the uh, chairman of the Foreign, uh, foreign Relations, uh, Madden Albright was secretary, uh, Speaker Hastert from the Republicans went, uh, uh, he was speaker. That was 1992. Uh, and look at Colombia now. Uh, 
And I think if, if we are able to achieve peace, Plan Colombia would have been or sh should be the most successful foreign policy bipartisan initiative of the U.S. in the whole history. Uh, you go, you go, and it's it's really the whole, the whole uh, uh, circle. If we are able to achieve peace, because remember where where we were, uh, or, or not of the whole history, but at least in the last 50 years. Um, and so, so, so I we are, we are very grateful for for the help that the U.S. has given us. Uh, but going back to your question, uh, the country itself uh, is going out of of that adversity. Uh, uh, with with a special force because uh, we have suffered a lot, and so we want to be successful. I see several hands now. There's a the woman in the back had her hand up first, and then we'll come forward. Thank you, President Santos. I'm Peggy Hicks with Human Rights Watch. Uh, there's a bill in Congress now that will greatly expand the scope of military tribunals to take on cases that are now handled in the civilian courts, including human rights violations and uh, arms trafficking and other offenses. It could even open the door for so-called false positive civilian killings to be handled by the military courts. Does your administration support that legislation or will it work to change that language? Uh, we have a very uh, respectful differences with the approach that the Human Rights Watch uh, is giving to this uh, special bill. There's no p possibility of uh, false positive or human right violations being addressed by uh, military courts. And this is something that we have said since the beginning. Uh, we have talked to you many times. We have explained many times why this is not possible. And uh, rest assured that we will not support any legislation that will allow uh, false positives or human right violations to be judged by military tribunals. Uh, that is something that we have said uh, to you many times and we continue to have that position. Uh, so that's, that's the position we have. Yes, at this table, the gentleman here and then the woman at the same table behind. Uh, Claude Erbson, uh, it gives me enormous pleasure, Mr. President, to address you as such as a nine-year-old kid I used to know in the newsroom of El Tiempo on weekends when your father brought you into play. <laughs> My question, Mr. President, is you mentioned all the land that is now unproductive or marginally productive. The Chinese have been buying up land in various places to safeguard their food supplies. Have you noticed, have you seen any indication that they are beginning to look at some of that land in Colombia? Uh, they have been interested, but we are not interested. Uh, we we have a legislation that uh, doesn't allow that, um, and um, we are very careful on who who buys land in Colombia and who doesn't. And uh, the legislation that we are passing will allow foreigners to have to purchase, but they will be uh, filtered, and uh, we don't want. Uh, anybody to buy half of Colombia. Uh, so that's what we, that's our policy so far. Thank you. Mr. President, Wendy Lures from the Foundation for a Civil Society. I'd like to return to Venezuela, um, where my husband was the American ambassador at one point. Um, right now there's a show trial going on with Leopoldo Lopez, the, as I'm sure you're very well aware and I am hoping that Colombia will be able to send observers to the trial, which is basically a show trial because they will not allow, there are 100 um, witnesses for the prosecution and two for the defense. So it would be extremely important if a neighboring country would do that. Secondly, in the New York Times yesterday and in the Washington Post, there were lead editorials about Venezuela trying to be uh, on, get their seat on the Security Council as a nominee of the Latin American bloc. So in, in your private capacity, or your public capacity, but in a private way, is there a way that you and Colombia, which have a very different view of the world, can say to the voting, which is in private and anonymous, that this seat, giving this seat to a country with those kind of violations would be 
a travesty. We may we have a, a small group of countries, Brazil, Ecuador, and Colombia, with the help of the Pope, who are trying to uh, facilitate a dialogue between government and the opposition. Uh, and we would like to, ha to, to have that leverage uh, to be able to be effective. And that's why, uh, and please understand, I cannot address the type of questions that you are <coughs> putting to me because then we will lose that leverage and we want to be helpful, helpful to both sides. So uh, uh, forgive my diplomacy, but uh, this is uh, the way the cookie crumbles. that has been at war for the last 50 years, how do you see the skills required to work in peace and to prosper in peace for Colombia? How and how I can the pro how do you see the skills required for our country to prosper under peace? And what gaps do we have? And how can the private sector help? Um, first of all, um, we need uh, to work on the culture of reconciliation. A country that has been at war for 50 years uh, opens many wounds, and that's why we have to start healing those wounds. And we've been starting, we're probably the first country in the history of the world that started repairing victims before the conflict is over. And uh, I've been we have so far re repaired more than 400,000 victims, repaired uh, uh, c uh, directly. We have more than six million victims. And so we have a long way to go. And, uh, but this is a process that takes time and needs a lot of help. The private sector just started a campaign called I am able, soy capaz. Uh, for the people who say, I am able to forgive, I am able to reconcile, I am able to help. And it, all this is geared towards changing the mentality of the country in order to make uh, peace easier. Um, I, w I was very much impressed. We, we are also the first country in the history of the world. And I took that decision consciously that are allowing the victims of the conflict to go to Cuba and speak to the two parts that are negotiating, to the government and to the FARC. And uh, why did I do that? Why did I allow that? Why did I encourage that? Because also for the first time the victims are the center of the solution of this process and their rights, their rights to truth, to, recon to uh, reparations, and to justice. And by allowing the victims to go there and say what, how they would consider, uh, w the, what they would feel uh, that is uh, done to, to, to feel repaired or how they would, uh, would uh, imagine the solution of a conflict where they would be happy with, this is a, a must because who, who else can, can <coughs> tell you how the victims should be repaired than the victims themselves? So this is a very, uh, a very uh, unprecedented process, but the beautiful thing about it is that the victims are uh, have discovered or, or we are discovering are more generous in, in terms of what they are able to accept than the average population. 
the victims are, are more willing to forgive. They're more willing to be generous. And this is a beautiful thing because this will facilitate the process of reconciliation. Now, what skills? Uh, we, we need the, uh, the, the reintegration process is a cumbersome process. We just, it's not just uh, you, have, you lay down your arms and you come here and work for Coca-Cola, no. Uh, you have to go through a process. And uh, that uh, is a cumbersome process, a difficult process. Fortunately, we have had some experience because we have been, we have demobilized so far more than 50,000 people in arms, 50,000. Uh, and we're learning every day. And the private sector can help a lot by opening their doors to, to reintegrated people, giving them jobs, and helping in the process of reintegration. I received a note that uh, the President's time is limited. He's very busy during this UN week. But please join me in thanking him for his very candid and open statement. <laughs> you were terrific.